Traditional Hollywood is very different from creator world and a lot of my friends are like, how did you make the jump from YouTube to traditional? And I'm like, listen you guys, I know everybody thinks that they need to publish the book with the publishing houses and they need to be on Netflix and the streamers, but you actually have the best job in the world. Creators have the best jobs in the world. When a camera was in my hand and I was filming, I was like, now this is a business. Because if I can create something that's never been created, I can sell it or I can make an audience. But the main fear that I have was like, how am I gonna pay off these student loans? Will I let my family down? I'm like throwing away all of the reasonable, stable options. But for all the fears, it would have been scarier not to do it. I'm Joe Franco and I'm a writer, a founder, a polyglot, and I'm a creator. What's crazy about growing up as a minority and undocumented immigrant, you're never told to put your voice out there. It's really like, do your work, keep your head down, and don't cause a scene. Like That's how I was raised. Like I was a child in hiding. So the fact that I ended up having this very public, crazy career on camera doesn't make any sense for how I was raised and how my mentality was. The seeds of the creator backstory were really rooted in like, I can work harder for longer than most people just because I was raised to be like that. I was, you know, helping my mom clean houses when we were growing up on Saturdays. I was born in Rio in Brazil. And then as a five-year-old, my mom took her three kids, me being the youngest, to the States. And we grew up in between cultures, in between languages, and I never really fit in. From a really young age, I want to speak multiple languages. I want to be creative. I want to travel the world. And I just couldn't be contained. After I got into college, I studied business. And after seven internships, I felt like I was shrinking myself, like I had to straighten my hair, dress really professionally. And I had always journaled, so I love documenting things. So I think when I realized that a video is nothing more than like a video journal, I was hooked. I always thought to myself, how cool would it be to document these moments because I never thought I would ever get to travel again. So to me, it was like an act of gratitude. The first time I started putting myself out there on YouTube, I remember feeling so honored that there were like 11 views. And I'm like, what? There are like four people out there, because of course I was the first six views, right? Like, so I'm just like, oh my God, there are people out there who don't know who I am and they care enough about me to watch this video. And then the first three comments, I remember being like, people care enough to comment? I still don't take that lightly because in this life, all we have is attention. And if somebody is giving you attention and they don't even know you personally, but they're like rocking with you on this journey, what an honor. Like these people are literally giving you minutes of their life they'll never get back. So when a camera was in my hand and I was filming and then I learned how to edit, I was like, now this is a business. Because if I can create something that's never been created, I can sell it or I can make an audience. And then when I realized like, okay, I never saw myself on travel TV. So now I'm on a mission to show people who don't think they belong in travel spaces or learning languages. I wanna show them that like, we deserve to be here too. It was super scary, but I kept going because I'm like, this is much bigger than me. And if my story can help somebody feel like they belong, we're doing a good thing. The first job, they actually offered me a full-time role. It was then that I had to make a serious decision because I was like, hmm, I could get this $45,000 salary, but I could almost predict exactly what my life would look like. Wake up on Monday, you go get coffee and somebody, Maureen in the coffee room is like, oh, it's another Monday. And then I go back to my desk and I come up with a bunch of ideas and I create the ideas. And then people above me get all the credit and they don't give me a salary increase. Maybe I'd get promoted. Maybe one day I could be the CMO. Maybe I could travel the world first class. But it still wasn't interesting enough to me because what was interesting was like that unknown. I know what this path looks like. I don't know what going to LA with a carry-on suitcase and a camera saying yes to this channel and not having a plan B. I don't know what that looks like. And that to me is more interesting because I could always go back. I have the skill sets to go backwards. 
but I don't know what's going to happen if I go forwards. So it was almost like the fear of the known was greater than the fear of the unknown. But the main fear that I have was like, how am I going to pay off these student loans? Will I let my family down? Especially having that immigrant background, right? Like we moved to the States to make an amazing future for ourselves. And I'm like throwing away all of the reasonable, stable options for a good life by turning these amazing jobs down. It was risky as hell, but for all the fears, it would have been scarier not to do it. We depended on each other. We had no backup plan. There was no other option. So the beginning of making money was a $200 blog deal here, $150 package of like a tweet and a blog and a little video. Going from three viewers to 1.2 million, like, girl, it doesn't even make any sense. It doesn't even make any sense. The early days always bring me back to the study abroad fair in my university when I had about three subscribers. And I baked cookies and I had a sign-up sheet and I'm like, leave your email address and subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can get a cookie. I was out there hustling, baking cookies, y'all. And so I remember when videos started going viral, I'm like, oh my God, like imagine how many cookies that would have been. And then what's crazy is that sometimes you get recognized and they tell you like, I grew up with your videos. I followed you since I was 12. And these are like grown people. So it's just nuts that the internet allows us to do this for not just a little bit of time, but to make it a lifestyle. I was reluctant because when you grow up knowing your mom took you out of a country because it's violent, you don't look at it like a tourist would look at it. I literally didn't want to go, but I was like, you know what, it's a part of my career, let me go. My aunt and uncle and little cousin were driving me back because I was there to film. And within five minutes of the car ride in the same neighborhood I should have been raised in, two motorcycles were blocking the street we were going down and it was a one way so we couldn't back out. And there were two men with guns standing in front of the motorcycles. My uncle who was driving had already gotten shot a few years prior so he never stopped driving. The guys kept shooting because they were so mad that we didn't stop and they couldn't rob the car so now they were shooting to kill pops are coming from all directions the car is getting shot up and as we're driving away all of a sudden i lose my breath i feel heat in my lower back and i duck forward and i say words i never in a million years thought i would say and I put my right hand on my back to see what was happening. And I just feel warmth, like blood is gushing out of me and I'm hunched over and my aunt and uncle immediately react and they drive us straight to the hospital. Everybody's in a panic and I'm like bleeding out at this point. I remember this moment like it was yesterday. I was like, you say you're strong. You're gonna prove it right now. You're surviving this. I had to wait 12 hours in the hospital because the doctors were on strike. So I didn't know if I was gonna be paralyzed, if it was gonna cause internal damage. And it was like that moment where in movies, your life flashes before your eyes. The bullet is still in me because it's too close to my spine to be removed. And it actually was the main reason why I decided to pivot. I realized that I had accomplished all of these amazing things on the exterior. Hit a million subscribers, I had made more money than I could have imagined. Hired people, fired people, trained people, gotten into the highest Hollywood agency. But I was disconnected from my family. I was missing birthdays. I was missing time with my niece and nephews. Like, I was missing all the things that I cared about. My values have always been family, closeness, like do it for the sacrifice of my ancestors. But I let this very beautiful, abundant, successful, very financially lucrative career take me away from all of the things that I knew in my core I loved. And the reason I always talk about journaling is because the journal told me the truth. I reread my journals a lot and what I kept seeing in the journals from 2015 to 2019, right as things were taking off, I would wake up and I would be like, all right, let's get these deals and then at night, it would be quiet and I would sit with my journal and I'd be like, damn, it was my, you know, grandma's 75th birthday today. I gave her a call, but you know, I only had 10 minutes before I had to work more. 
I was literally unhappy, but only when it got quiet. I was only unhappy with my own thoughts. I was happy on the surface. I was happy on camera. You watch those videos and I'm happy. But then in the quiet of night, when it's really just me and my thoughts and feelings, the proof was right there. So after many pens that ran out of ink, I finally mustered up the strength to do it around 2019. I was living in London with my old business partner. We were just growing apart, right? You start a business when you're 18, 19, you're about to turn 28, you're a different person. We always were very different people and that was part of our magic. That was part of the success. But we became different in how our values didn't line up anymore, what we wanted out of our content didn't line up anymore. My 10 year vision did not align. And so again, now you have to pull this thing apart that is not only a public brand, but it's a very successful business and I had to be like, yeah, I'm gonna have to do this because if I keep doing this, I'm just disrespecting myself and it's not doing anybody any favors because my heart isn't in this. And I came back home to buy a place near my family because I knew that if I'm on my deathbed, I won't be thinking about the cool moment I had in Bali. I'm gonna be thinking about hanging out with my niece and nephews and my siblings and my mom. I actually got this opportunity to audition for a Netflix show and it was crazy because it was the first time I walked into a room and I was like, hey, I'm Joe, just Joe. <laughs> and like, of course, that was the day that I freaking book a Netflix job, right? Like I get two seasons hosting this show called The World's Most Amazing Vacation Rentals. And that was the beginning of my complete pivot where I headed on my Netflix journey, which was a whole journey of itself because now I'm not a creator. Now I'm an on-camera talent. Now I get told, here are the things that you need to talk about, find your creativity in that. So I struggled with that as well. Because if you can't tell, like, I do a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, what do you mean? I can't help you with gear? Like, can I talk to you about segments? And they were like, Joe, calm down and do your makeup. Traditional Hollywood is very different from creator world. And a lot of my friends are like, how did you make the jump from YouTube to traditional? And I'm like, listen, you guys, I know everybody thinks that they need to publish the book with the publishing houses and they need to be on Netflix and the streamers. But you actually have the best job in the world. Creators have the best jobs in the world because there are no limits to anything. You tell the story how you want to tell it. If you have something to say, you turn a camera on and you say it. There's no executive telling you what to say. There's no budget that you're worried about. The freedom of speech that creators get is priceless. Of course, we work 55 million times harder because we're doing everything. But what I saw in that experience was like, creators do literally what a 13 person crew does on a daily basis. It makes us nimble and ready for everything. So I struggled, but that experience was amazing and I wouldn't trade it for the world because it gave me a look at how the sausage is made. And it was a big moment for me because I was like, damn, here I was thinking that I was just a businesswoman, but I've been a creator. And I was just kind of suppressing it because the debt and the immigrant guilt and all of the things that society makes you believe told me I was just a business person. But as a creator, you're both business and creative. I was on the shoot for a year. A lot of times they're like, get ready at eight. And then you don't shoot till 11 a.m. But you can't leave. So you're like, okay, well, what am I gonna do in this time? And that was a big time for me to realize the one thing I will always do is write. So on the show, I was always journaling, always writing. And people were like, Joe, what are you always writing about? And I read something that I had written to one of my co-hosts and he was like, what? I didn't know you until now. Like, that's who you are? And then he made a little video about it with my voiceover. And th this was when I started connecting the dots too. I'm like, hmm, I've never considered putting my writing in videos before. Cause writing was something so me and so personal. To me, it's scarier to put my writing on the internet than it is to host a Netflix show. Cause that's really me. In the middle of that year, COVID hit. And there were four months without a shooting. So this was the first moment where I was like, oh dang, like what am I gonna do now? No 1 million subscriber channel, no promise of a Netflix show, the world's shutting down, tons of crying on the floor, thinking about how to align what I loved, what I think the world needs, what I'm good at. And this is when I started posting my writing online and somebody asked me to do a 30 day journaling challenge. That turned into 90 days of me giving free prompts and I was getting so much value out of it. So I revived my YouTube channel and started my company, Joe Club.
Joe Club stands for the Journaling Club and also conveniently my name. When I got out of the show, it was like all hands on deck on that. Like I just went all in on Joe Club and then I decided to switch to ConvertKit. Cause ConvertKit is like creme de la creme. Like it is, it's top quality stuff. And I knew all my friends who were making really good money were using ConvertKit. I think it's what I need to take my business to the next level. Like if I'm really building this empire with intricate systems and processes and emails and funnels, I can't be doing it on a janky <laughs> email service. So I switched to ConvertKit on a leap and I was like, all right, well, it's almost like you have to invest in yourself for the opportunities to come. And that's kind of what happened. struggle sleeping because I can't stop thinking about work and my business and like things I could be doing better. And I know right now there's so much to optimize. And I think adding Joe Club Fluent is also a big project because you have to spend money that you may not get back in order to invest, right? So it's this idea of like, you're taking risks. And now if the risks don't reap rewards, it's not just you that's hurting, it's everybody who works for you and with you. You know, I think when you're a creator and you're worried about your own bills, it's still scary because if you don't get brand deals, if you don't get partnerships, you don't pay your bills. But now I think what keeps me up at night is like, if I don't get this company more revenue, if I don't grow this company, the team that I love so much can't get paid. I think what makes being a creator and an entrepreneur is so hard is that you have to do so much invisible work that like no one ever sees. And we are wired to want gratification as human beings. So like if I'm working for 15 hours a day and building backend automations and figuring out how to systematize like the Joe Club event scheduling, no one knows that I'm doing that. No one cares. They just want to show up and have a beautiful experience. And I think creators stop themselves often from creating or even like building something bigger because they they lose track of the goal because it's hard to stay the path when no one is cheering you on because they don't even know you're doing half the stuff. So if anything, it's like, I try to remember to celebrate the invisible work I'm doing. The first stage of my career, the game that we were playing was just like more subscribers, more viewers, more brand deals. And I'm like, when does this more end? And the truth is there is no end to that. That's an endless game. And this is a less sustainable business model because of two reasons. One, algorithms change and you have no control over it. So your YouTube channel could be getting tons of views one month and then the next month you ain't got no views. And the problem with that is not only your ego hurts, but in most cases, your money is directly tied to your number of views and your number of followers because how you make your money is based on those ad dollars and sponsorships. Number two, brand deals are so damn fickle. I've literally had to wait eight months to get paid for something. You can't plan your life with that level of instability. So then when you switch to a service like ConvertKit and you make email marketing and building funnels priority, you realize that if you talk about a lead magnet or something of value that gets them on your newsletter list, these people are much more valuable than the $5 per thousand views you'll get on YouTube. Because if they're opening your emails, they really care about you. And then if you launch a product, you can launch it to them directly in their inbox. So it really makes you start thinking about quality and not quantity. And it's healthier to think like that. Because I think as a creator in the YouTube world or Instagram or TikTok, we're always thinking like more subscribers, more followers. But what are all of those viewers for if all they're doing is spending 10 seconds with you and they never buy a product and they never show up when you have an event? That is not sustainable if you're trying to make this a living. What is sustainable is having a solid engaged email newsletter list where people are opening your emails, people are clicking on your links and you're actually selling stuff. So for the past few weeks, I've been working a lot on like creating the new membership, thinking about what the benefits are, making sure the tech is correct, working on the copy, and I'm finally ready to launch 
the first broadcast about Joe Club Fluent, which is very nerve wracking because you don't know if tech is gonna be working. And this is why I'm with ConvertKit, honestly, because this is one less headache that I have because everything else is very, it's like a domino effect. So I have been basically lining up my dominoes and this broadcast is gonna be like, boop, and knock everything over and hopefully mean I get new members, new lifetime customers, and Joe Club Fluent is something that continues to change people's lives. So here we go. New broadcast. Send it to the list, all subscribers. Continue. And just like that, the message has been sent, we wait. It's crazy to think that I set the goal to launch Joe Club Fluent this year. I remember when I said to myself, like, it's time for me to launch Joe Club Fluent. And I didn't think I could do it because it's a big thing that I'm building. And it's not like there are prototypes on it. I've never heard of a language learning, journaling movement that's a membership with live journaling sessions. So it's like everything is very moldable and the members are going to help me mold it. I have about 20 new members which doesn't sound like a lot, but we just launched and I've been doing this for long enough to know this is just the beginning of this movement. And then it's nuts that my book, Fluentish, which is a language learning journal, is also coming out in a few months. And in the front of this book that will be in global bookstores, it says, if you want more info, visit joeclub.world slash fluent, which is gonna take everybody directly into the Joe Club Fluent world that I will have built even more from now until this book is live. So I'm very happy, I'm very honored that people are taking a chance on me again because I'm building something from scratch with them. And the other day I was hosting a Joe Club session and there were all of these squares from people from all around the world. And what I noticed was that most of them were women. Most of them were women of color and most of them come from cultural backgrounds or from family situations where they too did not feel like they had a voice. And so it hit me recently. When I first started journaling, it was because I didn't feel like I was heard anywhere. And now with Joe Club and with Joe Club Fluent, I'm helping people document their own story too. And it's like, damn, talk about full circle moment. Growing up and being undocumented, it makes you feel like you don't belong. Like there's no space for you. You're undocumented, which means your story should not be told. And it's crazy because I never really thought about it, but my whole life in the silence of my journals, I was documenting. Maybe to prove to myself like I'm here, I exist, my voice matters. And even if I was the only one to read it back and care, I became a friend of myself in honoring my thoughts and feelings enough to write them down, to be like, this matters. I look at documenting as like, this is for whoever comes next. Just the same way that my grandma kept journals. She would film everything to make sure we didn't forget about Brazil. She would send us tapes in the mail, vlogging. My grandma was literally the OG vlogger. And when I started digitizing those tapes, she was like, I never thought anybody would care. And I'm like, grandma, of course, because your way of piecing together the world helps me understand my place. The same way that I hope Whoever finds my journals or watches videos or, you know, reads things that I write, they're like, damn, I see myself in this girl and I matter too. If she's telling her story, I should tell mine. And the thing about being a woman, a woman of color, an undocumented immigrant is that all of those things make you feel like your story doesn't matter because society tells you that, right? And if society doesn't tell you directly, your parents tell you, because your parents want to keep you safe. If you are somebody that is an other, your parents are going to want to teach their kids the rules of the world, which is, you're different. Don't cause a ruckus, don't stand out, do as you're told. So who are we to say, this is my story? And that's why I think if you are a person of color, if you're a minority, if you've ever experienced oppression, it is an act of service to share your story because there aren't enough of our stories out there to be told and to be shared and to learn from.